in Revelation chapter 16, we're going to try to cover this whole chapter. I may need a couple of extra minutes from you tonight. Uh, I'm going to take them anyway, so I'm not really asking permission. But uh, this is the chapter that we see the, the final bowls or the vials that are being actually being poured out here. We mentioned last week that in this part of our study, it seems to be emphasizing uh, not the mercies of God here, but the wrath of God. This is somewhat different to some degree. Uh, we mentioned last week that uh, from here to Armageddon, there seems to be no mercy or no salvation that's extended to mankind. Now, I want to point out here also that there is never really an end to God's mercies. The Bible said many times that his mercy endures forever. But there is going to be an end to those that have rejected him. And this chapter is a, a clear demonstration of that taking place. Now, Revelation 16, 1 said, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath, of the wrath of God upon the earth. Man's day has now apparently run its course the cup of sin is filled to the brim. It's now overflowing. But so is the wrath of God. We mentioned that it takes a while for vials or cups or bowls or whatever kind of a reservoir container. It takes a while till it's filled up and now it's filled up. So the voice that's coming here out of the temple, it has to be the voice of Jesus Christ himself. For 6,000 years, God has allowed man and even the devil to... Uh, somewhat have their own way, do their own thing. I, I probably would be better uh, saying that, do their own thing with their own choice. Uh, he's allowed that to continue. But now this chapter tells us that the voice of justice is now crying out. That God is now finally sick and tired of the injustices that have been done uh, by mankind. So the seven angels that we mentioned last week that seemed like they were standing in this formation ready to go at a bidding, they're now given their marching orders from the commander-in-chief himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're to go forth with their bowls or their vials of judgment, which they're going to pour out upon the sins of all mankind and on the corruption that's in the world. We're going to see in the following verses of this chapter that these bowls of wrath as they're called here, they're poured out upon the beast in his kingdom or his empire of wickedness. And so it doesn't appear that these uh, bowls of wrath are going to affect every person on the earth. And that's important. It's only going to affect, apparently, according to these verses, the beast and those that follow him, those that are involved in his system. Uh, it would appear that everyone was affected in the particular region or the area that they lived during the opening of the seals, if you remember that, and the sounding forth of the trumpets, if you remember that, because if the water was turned into blood in those instances, it would obviously affect everyone that was in the area. The sea was affected with wormwood. We covered that several chapters back. And so that would affect everyone and everything that would be in the sea. But these bowls of judgment, they're different. These are not the same thing because these are directed only toward the beast and his kingdom. Verse 2 said, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Seems almost like a reappearance of the plague that fell upon Egypt during the days of Moses. In fact, the word that's used here in reference to these grievous sores, it's the same word translated in the Old Testament as boils. Most scholars agree that what took place in the days of Moses in Egypt, with the plague of boils that came upon the person, that it was not some symbolic reference, it was literal. Their bodies were literally covered with these boils. So if the boils of Exodus, if it was literal in its, in its appearance here, then it would appear that these grievous sores that John spoke about that fall upon the beast and his followers, they're also literal as well. John said he poured out his vial upon the earth. Now, we don't have any way of knowing 
as far as what kind of a regional or uh, a geographical coverage each one of these vials being poured out is going to have. Some believe that the judgments, some scholars suggest that the judgments will cover the entire earth. I'm not going to debate about that. That certainly could be true. Others suggest that these will only cover the region or the area that the beast controls since he doesn't control the entire world. Again, I wouldn't debate about that. That could certainly be true as well. The fact is we just don't know. There fell a noisome and grievous sore. Just the fact that the judgment fell, it appears here by that language that it suggests that the plague was very sudden. It was very quick. It caused men in a moment to all break out with sores or boils or some translations even call it ulcers. Open sores that fester and cause pain. The words noisome and grievous here, they're from two Greek words that mean depraved or bad in nature. It also means that they're full of labors and pains in working mischief. Which according to the translators, that was meant to show that these ulcers or these boils, they're going to be very painful and they're going to be filled with corruption. Which means they're going to be running with infection all the time. Again, we don't know how the sores are actually produced. I'm not going to pretend to know that. We do know that they do occur as a result of this first angel pouring out this bowl of wrath. Some have even suggested, and I think we mentioned this in chapter 13, that if the mark here is actually the microchip that's placed under the skin, that it may burst or rupture all of them at the same time at the command of the Lord and cause this poison, this infection to flow throughout the body that would actually present itself as a boil or an ulcer. The fact is, we again don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But John did say it fell upon the men, those that had the mark of the beast. So it also suggests that it's only upon those that are uh, followers of the beast and his system that it doesn't affect everybody on the earth, just those that are involved with him. Verse 3 said, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Now, some scholars suggest this may uh, simply be a reference to the bloated or the mangled bodies of men that have uh, been just like it's been seen when, when uh, if you see some of the film footage of Normandy and and the battle there on D-Day and all the bloated, uh, disconfigured bodies that were floating in the bloody seas or especially after a sea battle when a sea a vessel has sunk and all the bodies are floating there on the sea. And they're suggesting that that may be what it's referring to, that when they died, their bodies simply float to the top and every living soul that was in the sea died. Verse 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water and they became blood. Now, this could actually mean real blood. I've heard people say, well, it couldn't be real blood because that's, that's just too much blood. Listen, if God wants it to be just blood, it'll be blood. I'm not going to look at this and say that could not be possible. With God, all things are possible. It could actually be real, literal blood, or it could be a reference to the water sources being contaminated with the blood of so many dead or dying bodies that the water systems are now so contaminated because they're flowing, they're running red with the blood of the dead. And so, some scholars suggest that the running of this uh, blood into the water from the dead corpses, the rotting corpses, that it would cause this water to be like drinking a deadly poison. I can tell you that men can live a lot longer without food than they can without water. Our bodies are made, I don't know what the percentage is, I tried to look that up a while ago, uh, but we are made up of mostly water. You have to have water to sustain life. And without water, the body is going to dehydrate, the organs will shut down, and the body will die. So now if you can get this picture in your mind, the sea has been turned to blood, the rivers and the springs that are flowing into the sea, they're also blood, and so this means that man now has no water. There is no drinking water. If you remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about the two witnesses that were witnessing during 
the uh, last half of the week, the last half of the tribulation. And one thing that they had power to do was cause it not to rain on the earth. So if it's not rain for some period of time, let's say they've shut off the rain and it's still off, this bold judgment is now being poured out upon them. Then the lakes and ponds, they've either already dried up or they're in the process of drying up. The rivers are also infected with this blood. So if it's not rain, the water's not running into the rivers as well. And so uh, they're drying up as well. And to even make things worse, the water that's left in the rivers or in the lakes or in the ponds or whatever underground reservoirs, they're also polluted with blood. Again, it could be actual blood. Whether it's actual blood, someone said it could be a chemical reaction. Someone was trying to prove, you know, this is an odd thing. We don't try to come up with something to prove that the Bible is right. The Bible's going to stand long after we're gone. But somebody trying to support this scripture said that if you mix a certain type of chemicals and put them in the water, they'll turn red like blood. Well, the Bible didn't say that they had a chemist out there working to do that. God doesn't need us to put some crutch under the Bible to prop it up so he don't look bad in front of people. He's not afraid of people's criticism. He can take it. Whether it's actual blood, a chemical reaction that causes water to appear blood red, or it's contamination of actual blood in the water. It doesn't matter. The end result is the same. The water is unfit to drink. And now with the stench of all the dead, the dying, decaying carcasses that fill the, the, the seas, and they're, they're floating up on the shoreline around the sea, disease is going to begin to spread inland. It's a domino effect. And now those that have the sickness, the fever, the, the, the thing that a person with a fever wants the most is cold water. But there's not going to be any water. So it's going to result in their death as well. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus, or you have judged like this. In chapter 7 and verse number 1, we saw the four angels that controlled the four winds that blow upon the earth. Here we see the angel of the waters. By identifying the angels that controlled the wind and now one that controls the water, it seems to imply here that there are angels that are appointed to certain positions or uh, they have certain responsibilities that they're assigned to. And this one, he is the angel of the water. He has the authority over the rivers and over the water. Somebody said he was the superintendent of earth's waters. While the judgment of God in turning the water into blood may seem like a very harsh thing to do while men are still living on the earth at this time, the angel here declares that the judgment of God is righteous. Others would say it's not fair. It seems like it's unreasonable. It seems like it's, it's unjust. No, the angel said here the judgment was righteous because all of God's judgments are righteous. Sin and sinners are going to be judged, but they're going to be judged by a righteous God. He's going to do what's right. Somebody said, I think Hitler ought to get the worst spot in the, in the lake of fire. Well, I'm not God, and I don't know how he's going to work all that out, but I can assure you I don't have to sit down and try to figure it out and give certain people points and other people more points, and I'm not in that kind of a business. God is a just God, and he's going to judge the earth righteously. God's not playing games in this chapter. Sin and, and unrighteousness, it's not a game with God. Verse 6 said, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Meaning, this is what they deserve anyway. This statement here seems to answer a question that's not even been asked yet. But it seems to answer a question that must have been anticipated. Because... There is a reason for the judgments that are falling upon mankind. They're reaping what they have sown. This is the law of reaping and sowing. 
We're seeing it demonstrated here. The judgment upon those that have killed or persecuted so severely those that refuse to accept the mark of the beast in his system. Now the judge of all the earth is turning it back on them. They're being judged for their actions and the judgment given to them is just as severe as what they gave to others. And so the angel said that this judgment is righteous. It's exactly what it should have been. It's righteous. Verse 7, And I heard another out of the altar say, Look at the language there. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. If you remember when we were uh, reading in chapter 6 and verse 9, we were talking about the souls that were under the altar. If you remember that, this verse, however, does not identify the origin of the voice. The voice. In fact, it doesn't say here that this was another angel. Look at the verse. And I heard another out of the altar say. In fact, some scholars suggest that the words here, out, another out of, should actually be omitted from the verse and that the statement should actually read, and I heard the altar say. Of course, we know the altar can't speak. The altar doesn't have a voice per se. But metaphorically, the altar does cry out uh, that the judgments of God are just and they're righteous. The altar cries out the same way that men would cry out or that angels would cry out, that the, just, the judgments of God, they're just and they're righteous. Men have died on altars of sacrifice. And in this uh, book of Revelation, many men have sacrificed themselves on the altar. They have decided not to surrender their will to the beast and his system. And so now their testimony of dedication is crying out like the blood of Abel cried out from the ground. Crying out from the altar. Now here, they call the great judge of all the earth, they call him the Lord God Almighty. The same name that we talked about last week in the, uh, at the Glassy Sea in chapter 15 in verse number 3. And also the same name that he was called in the Song of the Cherubim in uh, chapter 4 and verse number 8. Seven times in the book of Revelation, Jesus was called both Lord and Almighty. The first place was in Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 where Jesus introduced himself as the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty. All other places he simply referred to in praises as the Lord God Almighty or the Lord God Omnipotent, which is the Greek word, the same Greek word. Verse 8 said, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. If you consider this scenario and get this picture in your mind, this is a very disturbing picture here. Men have been stricken with sores, boils or open ulcers on their bodies. The seas have been turned into blood. Everything in the sea is dying. It's rising to the top. It's floating in a bloated body. It's decaying. It's stinking. The disease is spreading on the shoreline. And then those that have the fevered brow now, they can find out their water supplies have also been turned into blood. There is no safe water to drink. And now to beat it all, the sun is now shining down with such an intensity that it scorches their skin. It would appear that even nature itself has turned against those that have taken the mark of the beast. But when the sun scorches them, there's no question anymore as to the cause. Now they know that this is the judgment of God. According to the next verse, verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. When Moses first brought the judgments or the plagues upon Egypt, it was the magicians of Egypt that they duplicated what they considered to be magic tricks. They were able to do some of those. They were able to perform some of those. However, the time came when they were not able to mimic anymore 
They were not able to duplicate anymore to produce the similar results that Moses and Aaron got. And it was then that they acknowledged that this God is greater than our gods. That the power of, uh, of Moses and Aaron's God was a greater power than the gods of all of Egypt. Instead of these judgments actually in the book of Exodus turning the hearts of Pharaoh and Egypt around to repent and seek after the God of Moses and Aaron. No, the Bible said they rejected him because they hardened their hearts against God. It's also interesting to note here, almost uh, unbelievable, that the Bible said here that they blaspheme the name of God. They've obviously heard the name. Maybe they heard it because of all the announcements on the news broadcast uh, about the millions of people that have disappeared in the rapture. Maybe they heard the name of God because uh, of the two witnesses that preached his name. Maybe they heard the name of God because of the 144,000 who were sealed with the name of God in their foreheads. It's sad that even today, the vast majority of religions around the world, uh, they, they deny their converts the privilege the awesome privilege of bearing the name of Jesus Christ through baptism. Instead, they divert them using the paganistic uh, Roman uh, titles of the Trinity. They want them to do that, and they're not identifying with Jesus in baptism. But I'm glad I know who he is. I'm glad I know that name. I'm glad I've been buried in that name in baptism. Verse 10 said, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom uh, was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. We don't know how long these plagues last. The Bible doesn't say here how long they la they, they're going to last once they're being poured out. It may last a day, it may last a week, it may last the rest of the tribulation. We're not told. Any time frame that we would put on that would be uh, a pure speculation. But regardless whether it's a week, whether it's a month, whether it's a year, uh, whether it's the, the entire length of the tribulation, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a horrific time for the people that live on the earth then. We also don't know where the seat or the throne of the beast is going to be located either. Some believe that Babylon is going to actually be rebuilt and restored uh, to its original condition as it was in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in fact, there were some reports before uh, Saddam Hussein was, uh, uh, the country of Iraq was invaded. He was dethroned and, and put to death. There was the Japanese that were actually working trying to restore the ancient city of Babylon. Whether or not that project's going to be taken up, that will remain to be seen. But what we do know is that the beast is a man. He's going to arise to a, a very powerful political position and he's going to fulfill the role that's outlined here in the book of Revelation. He is a man that Paul referred to as the man of sin. It's also important to note here that it appears that the kingdom of the, the beast, it's going to be filled with horrible darkness while the rest of the world is not affected. Reminds us of the plagues of Egypt. In fact, when Israel was protected or shielded from all of those plagues that came against Egypt. The darkness described here, the Bible said it was so thick that men gnaw their tongues for pain. The word that's rendered gnaw here, it's not found anywhere else in the Bible. However, its meaning is very clear, it's very simple. It indicates a deep anguish or a deep torment. The same kind of a judgment fell upon Egypt when the ninth plague was poured out. Exodus chapter 10 verse 23 said, They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. It's a miraculous mystery. We don't know. People make all kinds of speculations about that. We don't know how God's going to do it. But the very God that spoke the words, uh, uh, spoke the words, let there be light, and the Bible said there was light. He's the same God that can divide the light from the darkness. 
He's the same God that can give us light here and then someone else in another neighborhood not have any light. I don't know how God's doing it. It's going to be miraculous. We cannot explain how darkness could be so thick over the kingdom of the beast that it causes people to gnaw their tongues for pain while the rest of the world doesn't even seem to be affected by what's going on. The prophet Joel spoke of this day of darkness in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and also I'm going to read verse 31. He said, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread uh, upon the mountains a great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more effort, even to the years of many generations. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Amos chapter 5 and verse 18 said, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it to you? The day of the Lord is dark and not light. When they realize that the judgments that are upon them are actually from God Almighty, they're going to be overcome with tormenting fear and pain. Verse 11 said, And blaspheme the God of heaven, because their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Even by blaspheming God, they were also acknowledging that he was the God of heaven. Seems hard to imagine here that anybody enduring such torment, suffering, and pain would uh, blaspheme the name of the Lord, instead of calling out to him for mercy. It's hard to imagine that. Verse 12 said, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof, thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We have this phrase used five times. The great river Euphrates, five times it's mentioned in the Bible. And I think it's probably there uh, to help emphasize the importance of the river, not only in biblical times, but also in the last days. In ancient biblical times, there were two rivers that held uh, the greatest importance over the kingdoms of men, and that was the Nile River and the Euphrates River. Ancient Babylon that we're talking about, in fact. Ancient Babylon was uh, built on the Euphrates River. In fact, the Euphrates River ran right through it. And so... The particular judgment of God here in this verse was not intended for a judgment to bring or to bring judgment to the, the headquarters of the beast, but it was rather to make way for the kings of the east. This is interesting. We've studied about this in this study before that there are some judgments here that may be uh, the result of man's doing. We could, man through his effort could bring about some of these judgments. And, and I say that to say that we already know that Turkey has uh, finished a dam on the Euphrates River that could, uh, in effect, it could stop the actual flow of the river. Now somebody said, well, that's not the only dam that's on that river. It's 1,800 miles long. It's certainly not the only one, but it is the one closest to the source of the river. So it could conceivably have the greatest effect upon the river. One thing to consider here is the fact that Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark landed, it's in Turkey. Mount Ararat is actually the source of the river Euphrates. The huge mountain range of Arafat, it's covered with snow and ice caps year-round. And it provides most of the water that runs into the Euphrates River. However, if according to the preaching of the two witnesses, it's not rained now for uh, several years at the command of the two witnesses. And then we consider here that the fourth vial, it caused the sun to be so hot that it scorched men. We can conclude then that the Euphrates is probably greatly reduced in its volume. There's been no rain you say, well, it couldn't get that uh, just in that length of time. Go down here and look at Norris Lake. Look at some of the rivers and streams in our area. Had it not been for the rains of heaven, we, we, would, have, 
we would have dust bowls there, big old holes in the ground, a sand trap. We, we don't even pay much attention to this, but if the rain is stopped for a length of time and it's stopped all over the earth, we don't know uh, what the region is going to be or the geographical spread of that's going to be, but if the witnesses stop the rain on the earth, it's going to be a marvel how dry things are going to become. Also, it could be that some judgment, and we're going to read about one here in a moment, may happen in the Mount Ararat region such as an earthquake. That could also result in the waters of the Euphrates shutting down instantly. There's an interesting prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 15 and 16. Seems to allude to this judgment, so I'm going to read it. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, meaning the bay. Some believe it's the bay where the Nile runs into. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams. You know, when God parted the, the waters of the Red Sea, the Bible said he caused a strong east wind to blow all night. You know, somebody said, that's, that's somebody refueling. I almost told you who it was refueling. God waved his hand over the waters and dried them up. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it. The word smite there is also sometimes translated as dry it with a drought. In, uh, shall smite it in the seven streams, which is the Euphrates, and make men go over dry shod. The word dry shod means sandals. They can walk across the water in sandals and still not get their feet wet. That's pretty dry. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came out, uh, came up out of the land of Egypt. Of course, this does not tell us how the rivers dried up either, but we know it's going to happen. God's going to do it. As far as the kings of the east, we're not told who they are either. But we do know that there are a lot of people that live east of the Euphrates from Cambodia, Vietnam, China, India, Japan, many other countries that live uh, east of that. But something will happen that will cause this vast number of people to invade the Middle East. However, I want to also add here, it seems a little confusing that in the 21st century, that a river would be dried up simply for allowing armies to march over uh, this generation or this age that we live in with the technology we have, we can cross any river we want. It doesn't seem like it would be a complex thing for armies to cross a river. It doesn't seem like a big deal. So I want to say with a little bit of confidence, no proof here, there's something must, there must be something more involved than just drying up the river so an invading army can cross to do battle. There's and we don't have all the secrets of the scripture. We don't know everything, but God's got a plan. Verse 13 said, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth, mouth of the false prophets. Well, of the false prophet. This appears to be some kind of an allegiance. It's a conference of some sort with the uh, heads of the, the uh, uh, evil empire of the beast. The three evil spirits are described here like frogs that go forth into the world. This very interesting metaphor here because the frog was symbolic for many years as the creature who loves quagmire. They love the mud. Not to mention they were also used symbolically because they loved to sound off at night in the darkness. They croak with this raspy and guttural voice and, and they seem to sing through other uh, frogs or two other frogs in the region in their way of communicating. This is important here because they were seducing spirits or doctrines of devils according to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. They're spreading their lies and their deception from this conference or from this alliance here, this unholy alliance. And they're going to do all of this deceiving until they gather all the kings of the earth together. They're going to bring them through all of this deception and gather them to the battle of Armageddon. Verse 14 said, For they are the spirits of devils 
working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The world in this passage is now on a collision course. No turning back. It's going to lead to utter destruction. The leaders of the nations of the world, they're referred to here as the kings of the earth, and they're persuaded, they're motivated by forces of darkness. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 22, that false Christ and false prophets would arise. They were going to show signs and wonders that would seduce, if it were possible, even the very elect. Now, I don't pretend to know what it means by these evil spirits working miracles, unless someone suggested that it would take a miracle to get all the nations of the world to come together into one region under one person's control for this battle. And so it may be the miracle is this, this um, a miraculous deception that is somehow uh, infiltrating the hearts of the, the leaders of all the nations of the world, gathering them to the Middle East. Joel chapter 3 verses 9 through 12 said, Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into, into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither calls thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. It's very interesting to note here that this verse in Revelation 16 and 14, it said that it is the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This sight must be awesome. I don't want to see it from here. I want to see it on the other side. But to witness this vast army of armed men, they're all making their way to the Middle East, to this one valley region, the valley of Megiddo. They're coming from all directions, from countries around the world, and they're coming to meet in one spot, all headed for a final showdown in the valley of Megiddo. The earth has never seen a gathering of military people like this one. And then all of a sudden there's a pause, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This verse appears to be a pause in the action because verse 16 obviously picks up the story setting again. It's obvious that the armies that are gathered here have no idea what's waiting for them. They're going to battle against God himself. And yet, it seems like after all of this intensity and you're waiting for this great crescendo, all of a sudden... It pauses, and he said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. It's as though the Lord is telling these weary pilgrims that have struggled now for seven years, through all of the persecution and the difficulty and the loss of family members and the hardships brought on by the tribulation, they're here encouraged to remain alert, to be aware, to watch. To look up, don't fall asleep, because any time now, any day now, at any moment now, the Lord is going to bring deliverance. What a spectacular event it's going to be. Verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Somehow, the demonic spirits have gathered all of these people to this one place. God gathered them but he sent spirits to do it. John said in Revelation 19, 19, where we have the actual battle taking place, he said, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. What fools that think they can battle against God and win. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. Armageddon is a word taken from Armageddon. 
It means the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo is a town located some 60 miles north of Jerusalem. It's a town that overlooks the plains of Megiddo. It's also called the Valley of Jezreel as well. When Jesus grew up in Nazareth, he could stand on the hill at Nazareth and look over into the Valley of Megiddo. I've often wondered if Jesus is a boy growing up there. I wonder if he sat on the rock ledge that overlooks the valley. I wondered as I toured Israel, did he sit there and look down there and, and did he have this knowledge that one day I'll lead an army that will come back out of heaven and destroy the armies of the Antichrist. And all of that's going to end in that place. I wonder if that went through his mind. Napoleon said of this place when he stood on the rim of the Armageddon region. He said, this is the ideal battleground for all the armies of the world to meet. And that's where they're going to meet. Verse 17 said, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Now the previous bowls, the judgments, They've been poured out on the land, the sea, the waterways, the sun, the kingdoms of the beast, the river Euphrates, and now this one, it's poured out in the atmosphere. It's going to affect everything on the planet. And the word or the phrase, it is done. That's the word spoken from the temple in heaven. It reminds you of the word spoken from the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. The voice from Calvary said, the blood work is done. Redemption is paid for. All men can have access to the throne room of God. But this statement signifies the end of the times of the Gentiles. This is the end to Satan's a rule and terror over the earth. This statement is going to be made one more time in chapter 21 and verse 6. It's going to be spoken of after the millennium. After the great white throne judgment, it's going to be spoken of when John begins to describe uh, for us the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 18 said, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. We've already heard this statement made by John three other times. Just before the seals were opened, he made it just before the trumpets sounded forth their judgments and just before the bowls of wrath were poured out. The first time there was no mention of an earthquake, but the other two times there was both places a mention of an earthquake. And yet none could compare to this one. This will be one so great it has never been like this on the face of the earth before. In fact, the effects of the earthquake is going to be so great it's going to change the appearance of the earth. Verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This may very well be the earthquake that Zechariah spoke about. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, when he described the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. He's going to place his foot upon the Mount of Olives, the very spot from where he ascended into heaven almost 2,000 years ago. And from what we read in Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 through 12, it appears that this earthquake is going to be so great, it's going to raise the, the Dead Sea level so high that the Dead Sea is going to flow back into the Red Sea, so it's going to bring life back to the Dead Sea. The landscape of the earth, the whole earth, is going to be changed by this earthquake. There has never been one like it, the angel said, since there were men dwelling on the earth. Now reference to this great city, and I'm just about finished here, being divided into three parts, it's a reference to the city of Jerusalem. It's interesting to note here that while Jerusalem will certainly suffer from the earthquake by being divided into three parts, it's not destroyed like other cities are destroyed. John said that the cities of the nations fell. If we were to take that literal, meaning that the great cities of the, the earth, they fall because of the effects of a worldwide earthquake. Forget about a Richter scale reading. This is an awesome prediction to say the least. 
When you think of the great cities of the earth, the millions upon millions of people that live around all of these skyscrapers whose tops are reaching into the clouds, all of a sudden there's going to be an earthquake that's so violent, so intense that they're all going to come tumbling down. What a chaos. What a judgment. What an earthquake. The fact is, Jerusalem seems to be the only one exempt from this destruction. Psalms 125 and 1 said, They that trust in the Lord, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved or removed, but abideth forever. Babylon, on the other hand, is going to be an object lesson to all mankind. God's going to throw Babylon, the evil kingdom, down with such intensity, such violence, that nothing will remain. Verse 20 said, And every island fled, fled away, and the mountains were not found. This may be what the prophet Isaiah was speaking about when he wrote in chapter 40, verses 4 and 5, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. We can only imagine what the earth is going to look like after such a cataclysmic event. The shaking of the whole earth. We can't even comprehend what it's going to be like. The islands are going to disappear beneath the ocean and the seas. The mountains that have stood so high as though they were challenging men to try to reach the peak, they're going to be brought low to be level with the plains. Verse 21 said, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. One of the great things or the most awesome things about these hailstones, they're not golf ball size. They're not baseball size. They're about the weight of a talent, about a hundred pounds. We can't even comprehend the kind of destruction that that would have. Hundred pound hailstones hitting the earth. But when this day is over, this day of wrath, this day of judgment's over, those that remain on the earth, they're going to see the Lord come back and establish a kingdom ruling on this earth. They're going to have the privilege of, of uh, entering the millennial reign under uh, the reign of the King of Peace, the Prince of Peace. The past seven years, they've experienced anything but peace. But now when Jesus comes back to the earth, it's going to be like man has never imagined. All things are going to be new. It's going to be like God intended in the beginning when Adam and Eve were placed here on the earth before the devil and the temptation turned them uh, away from God's plan. It's going to be an awesome event. I want to be on the other side when it's taking place on this earth.